We're really, really happy to welcome you um, to our School of Education event. My name is Lauren Lindstrom, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the UC Davis School of Education. So tonight is our first ever lecture series. We're calling it Expanding Equity in Educational Research, thanks to a number of dedicated faculty who are putting together this series. Uh, but this is the beginning. It's a great kickoff for us. We talk a lot about our values of social justice and equity and access in the School of Education. And some of us think about that in K-12. Some of us think about it in leadership, uh, a few in higher education. So I think it's really fitting that our very first lecture really turns the lens back on ourselves and we start to really carefully examine um, our own experiences and our own context in higher education. So I'm thrilled that you can join us and I now want to turn it over to um, Professor Danny Martinez who really spearheaded putting this together for us. Thank you Dr. Um, Dean Lindstrom for, for supporting this endeavor. Um, before we begin I just want to get a show of hands. I want to know who's in the audience. Can, I, can you raise your hand if you're an undergrad? here at UC Davis? All right. Let's give it up for the undergrads. <laughs> Do we have um, any graduate students, MA, PhD, EDD students? All right. Let's give it up for them. Um, UC Davis staff, who is, um, all right. Let's give it up for them. And finally, School of Education or, or, or faculty across campus. Those of you in the audience, thank you. Thank you all for supporting us today. Um, I, I welcome you, as um, Dean Lindstrom did, to our Expanding Equity in Education and Research Lecture Series, and I'm excited to kick this off with our guest today. I want to um, acknowledge a few folks. I want to acknowledge Dr. Uh, I want to acknowledge Raquel Aldana. Is she, I think I saw her. Where is she? At? Raquel Aldana. Um, she is our Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and um, Law School Professor. Ooh, I keep dropping that. Okay. Um, who supported us in, 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 in co-sponsoring this event through the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, so again, I want to thank Raquel Aldana and, and, her, and her office. We're going to jump in and we're going to begin now. I'm excited today to introduce, keep on going, All right. to introduce our, our speakers. Okay. So does that mean? Okay, I'm gonna go. Nolan's going first. Okay. <laughs> so first, but hold on, have a seat. Let me introduce you. Let me introduce you. Okay. So I'm very excited and thrilled to introduce Dr. Nolan Cabrera, who's assistant prof associate professor. Excuse me, associate professor in the Center for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona. He studies the racial dynamics of on college campuses with a particular focus on whiteness. For this work, he, has been he was featured in the MTV documentary, White People, as the only academic in, in, in that film. Check it out. Um, <laughs> Dr. Cabrera has been involved in the ongoing controversy around the Tucson, Tucson Unified School District's former Mexican and American Studies program, um, which is still ongoing, and ethnic studies across the nation. Um, Dr. Cabrera's publications have been featured in leading education and higher education journals such as the American Education Research Journal, the Review of Higher Education, the Journal of College Student Development, and Research in Higher Education. And his work has been used extensively in education, policy, and legal environments. Dr. Nolan Cabrera was a recipient, has been the recipient of the prestigious National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. He has also been named a University of Arizona College of Edu Education Erasmus Scholar, an Emerging Scholar for the American College Personnel Association, faculty affiliate at UT Austin's Project Males, and faculty fellow, fa <clears throat> faculty fellow for the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education. Dr. Cabrera earned his BA at Stanford University and his PhD in Higher e Education and Organizational Change from UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. He is a former director of a Boys and Girls Club in, San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area and is originally from McMinnville, Oregon. So please help me welcome Dr. Nolan Cabrera. I love technology. Yes, it worked. <laughs> Good afternoon. afternoon. 
try again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love the, I need the energy. We've been going a long time today, and, but this is, this is wonderful. I appreciate that. Although, I, I see, undergrads, you don't need to play like church. You don't have to sit in the back pew. You, it's, <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, what I'm going to talk about today is a core concept that I developed in my book, White Guys on Campus, called White Immunity. And it's essentially my take on white privilege. And so you're going to go on the roller coaster intellectual journey that brought me from point A to point B. Now, having said this, I have to start off and give credit where credit is due. I actually got my inspiration for this work from Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly, Fox News commentator, disgraced sexual harasser, all these wonderful things. Uh, I watch Fox News on a regular basis because I like having high blood pressure. <laughs> but in all honesty, he was taught, he loved when he was on television, he loved railing against the liberal left, liberal elites, uh, leftist academics, and in particular, white privilege. And so, I know how to drink. He made Christmas, let me try that again. Um, so he was highly critical of white privilege and white privilege conversations. And one night back in 2014, uh, he said something that really just crystallized some thoughts in my head. And he said, I didn't experience white privilege when I worked in Carville, painted houses, and mowed lawns. I'm going to have to exempt myself from conversations around white privilege. Now, ignoring temporarily for a moment that as a straight, cis, hetero, white man, Exempting yourself from uh, white privilege conversations is sort of the epitome of white privilege. <laughs> but all that cognitive dissonance aside, it does, it does show kind of a semantic issue with white privilege. And what I mean by that is privilege, the term privilege, it, it, in, it invokes this semi-charmed life where everything is gravy and it's 74 and sunny all the time. and, and the reason why I bring this up is that a lot of times white privileged conversations get derailed because a white body individual will say, look, here is a time in my family's past when we were struggling, ergo, I do not have white privilege. Whether that struggle was this generation or seven generations ago, it's always, we struggled, therefore we did not have privilege. A very common framing of it is, are you telling me that the Obama daughters have, uh, the, the uh, white kids from Appalachia have, uh, have, have white privilege relative to the Obama daughters. And it's always white kids from Appalachia, as if you actually cared about white kids from Appalachia. White kids from Appalachia are very rarely ever used as an example, except as a wedge between what people who are looking for racial justice and people who are not having, trying to have a conversation about white privilege. And it's always, you know, barefoot, black and white photograph, and look at how privileged the Obama daughters are. Now, while this is an issue of, you know, let's make an apples to apples comparison, um, again, it does get to that underlying issue, the semantics of white privilege. And so I started, I actually started not necessarily taking these methods of derailing a conversation seriously, but I wanted to go revisit. I thought, you know, it's time to start thinking a little bit more about white privileged conversations. Now, now that I, I, I'm developing white privilege, and I want to be really clear about this, because it does drive me nuts when academics say, hey, got a new concept for you. Because the previous concept was garbage, look at what I've got for you. I have no patience for that, OK? The fact that we're still talking about white privilege 30 years after Peggy McIntosh created it means it has a staying power and it actually has a cultural power that I wish one of my articles would have. So I'm not trying to throw shade at Peggy McIntosh, but I am saying we need to keep moving. We need to keep developing, okay? So what I'm saying here is when you start looking at the scholarship on white privilege, there's a bunch of issues that start coming up. The first one is that there's a minimal structural interpretation. It tends to be very individualized. I, as a white person, have white privilege. And it doesn't really dig much deeper than that. At the same time, and we keep forgetting this, that white privilege conversations frequently when race comes up tend to be the beginning and the end of that conversation. We forget that this is just racism 101. This is not a deep engagement with racism. It's supposed to be a jumping off point. 
And again, that's not Peggy McIntosh's fault. That's more of how we've applied or misapplied it. A lot of times, because it's that individualized form of racial analysis, it almost becomes a form of racial confession. And this one does bother me, especially in practice, where white privilege conversations have been, again, I, look at me, I have identified a white privilege in my life. And it's almost like then the group says, oh my goodness, yes, you are absolved of your racial sins, go with God and have kind of an Ash Wednesday thing. Anyway, that's beside the point. And then the, at the same time, there's the issue of the metaphor of the knapsack. She talks about this invisible knapsack. Well, here's the thing with a knapsack. You take a, you take a knapsack on and you take a knapsack off. In a racialized society, you do not have the ability to remove your racial background. You do not have the ability to take your racial, your racial identity on and off. It is with you at all times. And ultimately, what white privilege conversations do in practice is it recenters the white experience. Again, this is how I am experiencing white privilege instead of understanding what is happening in the opposite direction, what is happening on the other side of the tracks, what is happening in another community. And that's where I'm going to start developing white immunity. And then it was really telling at the end of Peggy McIntosh's piece where she offers her examples of white privilege in her life that she could identify. And so she says things like, I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. And what ended up happening was I saw, that's not necessarily elevating her as a white person. That's just a description of baseline humane interaction to which, because of systemic racism, people of color are not guaranteed. That is, that whiteness becomes a form of a social inoculation against this adverse treatment that people of color are receiving on a regular basis. So again, this is how white immunity started to come in. I was like, oh, social inoculation, maybe there's an immunity that is granted on the basis of whiteness. And at the same time, I was watching the very problematic comedian Paul Mooney, and he started talking about whiteness as the complexion of protection. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating, complexion of protection. Again, I'm not necessarily that's elevating me so much as it's protecting me from this disparate treatment. Now, as I use the term whiteness, I want to be clear about one thing, that as Zeus Leonardo says, there's a distinction between whiteness and white people. He says, whiteness is a racial discourse, whereas the category white people represents a socially constructed identity, usually based on skin color. Whiteness is not a culture, but a social concept. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. But to, and, and so I want to be, instead of diving into all the nuances of this, what I'm going to do instead is ask the underlying question, and this is again part of my intellectual journey, how did we get here? Because whiteness is not some eternal characteristic of the human condition. It's something that was historically created and manifest and structured within society. And so I started asking myself, how was it manifest? What exactly happened? And this is important because, as the brilliant theorist Paulo Freire argued, that looking to the past must only be a means of understanding more clearly who and what we are so that we can more wisely build the future. And so as I was looking to the past to build the future, that was sort of a guiding principle of what I was trying to do. And what I found was that through a lot of critical whiteness interrogations of history and the way that whiteness was created historically, first of all, there was not a thing called whiteness when there was the first uh, conquest of the Americas. People of European descent tended to be identified by their country of origin and not necessarily by this thing called whiteness. Now, I'm not, obviously colonialism required a belief in the inherent superiority of these folk, but it wasn't necessarily always constructed around whiteness. And what ended up happening though was that the ruling elite in colonial Americas started getting really nervous when multiracial coalitions started disrupting the existing social order. The tipping point was Bacon's Rebellion. Now, please keep in mind, I'm going to be going over a couple hundred years of history in the span of about eight minutes. So it's going to seem like I'm thinking, you know, there are these white guys in the back saying, you will do this and you will do this. It's not like that. I'm talking just broad, <laughs> broad strokes of history. So please be aware of that. So, but Bacon's Rebellion was really key because you had a group of free blacks and low-income people who would later become white coming together because the governor of Virginia said, 
you are not to go into Indian land. Here's the western boundary of our state. Do not go any further. And they said, no, we're going to go raid anyway. When they did this collectively, it sent shockwaves through the ruling elite because they said, oh, my God, they can just disobey us if they want to. We have to figure out a way to break up this coalition. And they thought that one of the ways of doing that was giving the low-income folks of European descent a little bit of skin in the game. OK, that's a horrible pun. Let me back up. Um, but giving them a little bit, pushing them just slightly above black folk, just slightly above native folk, would make it impossible to create these multiracial coalitions. So put them on slave patrols. Make them overseers. Don't give them meaningful economic uh, equality. But give them ways to think of themselves as superior, and it will break up this coalition. At the same time, Christianity played an incredibly important role in this. Now, I don't want to be reductive and say the only function of Christianity is the creation of whiteness. Cool. Uh, <laughs> the bells. Um, but in terms of whiteness formation, Christianity played a central role. And it was a very strange cyclical argument. Why are we the most civilized people in the world? That's the starting off point. And then it would be, well, because we have Christianity. Well, why do we have Christianity? Because we're the most civilized people in the world. And the parameters of the debate were, should we try to civilize these heathens with the word of God, or are they too infantile, are they too childlike to really hear it and embrace it? But ultimately, it was using Christianity as a mechanism of creating a belief in racial superiority. At the same time, there was this ideology. It, became, it started becoming more and more explicit. If you want to hear about how these racist ideas became so ingrained in society, I'd highly recommend that you read Ibram X. Kennedy's Stamp from the Beginning and how the relationship between racist laws and racist thought and the massive expansion of racist thought that usually accompanied racist laws being implemented historically. Now, it's a massive book. It's like 500 pages, so you'll be out it for a couple of months, but it's worth it, trust me. What W.B. Du Bois found, though, the eminent sociologist, was that because of this ideology of whiteness and white superiority, that there was this thing called the public and psychological wages of whiteness. Again, I may not be wealthy, I may be downtrodden, but at least, at least I'm not black. And that carried a lot of white folk through this time. And interestingly, if you want to read another interesting book, um, there's one called Dying of Whiteness Today. And the same ideology is being manifest. People are literally dying in the Midwest because they don't want to be on Obamacare. And it's a very explicitly racist ideology that they're literally killing themselves to uphold. And it gets back to this underlying issue. So Du Bois talked about this, and Malcolm X talked about this, and many a critical whiteness scholar has talked about this but that the second word that most European immigrants learned upon arrival was the N-word only followed by hello. It was an immediate part of folks coming over from, from Europe. And that was really strange because the, the Irish were told by their leaders, we haven't been treated so well by the English. Align yourself with the marginalized and oppressed when you go over to the Americas. They got off the boat they saw how poorly black and native folk were being treated, and they said, no, that's, that's too much to ask of us just coming to this new land. And so instead of going in the direction of the marginalized, they said, well, you know, let's try to push them down and don't think of me as black and give myself just a little bit of upward mobility over them, a little bit of racial superiority of, over them. And then what ended up happening was that whiteness required cultural assimilation. It required you losing where you came from. And if you want to see how perfect this assimilation occurred, talk, talk to a random white friend of yours and say, where's your family from? They say, Germany. Then say, OK, what, what, are, what are some great German holidays, cultural celebrations that you and your family practice? And almost uniformly, it'll be crickets. Because there's the, oh yeah, our, we came from there, but it doesn't have any social meaning. 
Whereas you ask many people of color, what's great about being from your culture, it will come out with things like, look at our family and the food and the dance and the cultural celebrations and look at how amazing Coco was and how vibrant and, sorry, I have a nine-year-old so I go back to cartoons a lot. Um, but the point being that whiteness as a category, it was an empty social category. It wasn't, it was assimilation, but an assimilation into social domination, but not into anything that we would consider necessarily a productive culture. And then in the end, the legal construction of whiteness reinforced this. It didn't so much grant increasing rights to white folk because they were white. It said, here's a universal standard of humanity and now we are going to strip rights away from people of color. You are going to say, if you are black, you cannot, own, you cannot own a gun. If you are native, you cannot own land. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. And what ended up happening was this thing called definition through negation. You take away rights, you take away rights, you take away rights, and then what's left is whiteness. Not by what it is, but defined by what it is not. And so in summary, what happened is this was a, whiteness is a rich and poor exclusionary coalition, largely based upon Christianity and anti-people of color ideology, inherent superiority of white people, and ultimately an empty social category. But then folks, this is where there requires a leap. Folks say, well, yeah, that was how the country was founded. There was a lot of systemic racism in the founding of the country. Well, what about the 1960s? Well, let's think about that for a second. You can't expect several hundred years of systemic racial marginalization and structuring to be undone in the span of about seven or eight years, especially considering that the decades following the 1960s were largely regressive in trying to undo all that social policy. Now, one of the big things that the 60s did, though, was it moved racism underground, and it challenged the overt ideology of inherent white superiority. But what happened was whiteness became rearticulated as normal, an unmarked social category, which is why a lot of my research actually really, for lack of a better term, really messes with folk who are white, because I actually name whiteness and white folk. And when you're not used to being named as white, it becomes really socially disruptive. And the way that that, normaliz that normalization exists constantly. In February, what history month is it? The audience participation, hell, yeah, say wake up, yes, what? Black history month, good. Why don't we refer to the other months as white history month? I know that's a very low hanging fruit, simple example, but the idea is that when you're normal, you don't have to explicitly be noted, you know? You say, well, there's a black student union, a Chicano student union, where's the white student union? It's called the Student Union. <laughs> Daniel Tosh, and I know he's another problematic comedian, but he made a cogent point about 10 years ago, so bear with me. I, I need to be clear about that, because anytime I say something about someone, it's not a wholesale endorsement of everything they've said in all times. To just bear with me. So he said, did you ever notice when someone says, this is a really safe neighborhood, they mean it's really segregated, and there was crickets, and he said, Wait, did that cut a little too close to home, Orange County? <coughs> Here's the funny part. Sorry. I tell that joke quite a bit, but whenever I make it personal, so I tell it in Tucson, I say, it's like a joke Mad Lib. I can say, <clears throat> that cut a little too close to home, Oro Valley, which is the largely white northern part of town, and all of a sudden the people were like, <laughs> that's so, whoa, wait a minute. Because every major city has that. There's the side of town, the dangerous side of town, which is code for brown, black, poor. Again, we talk about race, but without really talking about it. Then there's the good side of town, which is the largely affluent, largely white side of town. And I'm sure you all probably know which side of town is here or wherever it is that you come from, but it's endemic and we don't explicitly talk about it, but it's still there. But ultimately, and this is where I usually lose the audience a little bit, but bear with me. If we're talking about structured racism, we need to be honest about it. Because there is massive continuity between the past and the present, 
The terminology, the correct terminology, is white supremacy. That's what the country was founded upon, and that's what we're still dealing with in this day and age. Usually when I present this, very few people will question the validity or accuracy of that terminology. But what they will do is say, well, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you losing the audience? And from my vantage point, I can always see when people just kind of clench up just a little bit. They get, they get a little fuchi face. They're kind of like, eh. And so I just do ask you, though, if you are uncomfortable with that term and are not necessarily questioning the validity of it or the accuracy of it, sit with that discomfort. Think about it. Self-interrogate, because there's one truism that I can guarantee, and that is that it is more difficult for people of color to thrive and survive in a white supremacist society than it is for you to feel uncomfortable with the terminology usage. So then this leads us to the concept of white immunity. Again, there's a social inoculation that prevents white people from the disparate treatment. But it, first and foremost, it comes from the systemic reality of white supremacy. And yes, Peggy McIntosh gave a nod to that in one sentence in her piece, and I want to make that explicitly clear, that the hundreds of years of racial structuring has led to this point. Because a lot of times people say, well, you know, if I can just give up my white privilege, everything would be great. Let's try to find a way, and I'm like, that's not possible. It's important to take personal account of where white privilege or white immunity, whichever term you prefer, I hope white immunity, but that's my own personal bias. Whichever one you choose, that's your own personal choice, but the point being that until the systemic reality is completely eliminated, this, these conditions are still going to be in place. It doesn't eliminate the need for a localized action, but it means that it would be naive to think that we can have a white privilege-free zone, a white immunity-free zone in the absence of white supremacy, or it, with the presence of white supremacy still going. What white immunity, though, also requires us to do, in particular requires white people to do, is to ask the question of what didn't happen. What is something that happened what was something that didn't happen to them that was happening to people of color? What is happening as some people of color are walking through the store and are being followed? There was that horrific video down in Orlando of the, of the, of the, the child of color who was about six years old getting zip tied. And that is an absolutely horrific event. And then the underlying question is, when was the last time something like that happened to a six-year-old ch uh, white child? I'm not, please, now let's not get it twisted. I'm not saying white children should get treated that way. I'm saying nobody should be treated that way. And then the idea is looking at what is not happening in your community and understanding that. Because as I talk about a great deal in white guys on campus, I know, shameless plug, but anyway, the, a lot of the guys, because they didn't see racism in their lived experiences, they would make the logical, incorrect extrapolation that therefore racism is not happening anywhere. And that people who are talking about it must be making it up, making a mountain out of a racial molehill. When in fact, it was that their white immunity prevented them from this kind of disparate treatment. And ultimately, it requires a sense of empathy. Not sympathy, I have no patience for sympathy. Sympathy says, I'm better than you. Sympathy says, oh, you poor thing. Instead, empathy looks at each other and says we are all part of one social body, and if there is harm being done to one part of the social body, there is harm being done to all of us. It is a sense of linked fate that is required. So I have no patience for sympathy, but empathy is required in this, and the only way to get to that empathy, again, is to understand what's happening outside of the white community. And ultimately, with that, with the white immunity, comes a white responsibility. It's not enough simply to say, oh my goodness, I have it. Please, please absolve me of my white guilt. It requires me to say, I have this white immunity. There's a systemic racism that is occurring. How can I disrupt it? And the very first thing to do is to educate yourself on it. Because first and foremost, it is not the responsibility of people of color to educate white folk on issues of race. When they do so, thank them for their efforts because it's a psychological toll on communities of color that we are continually asked to give on a regular basis. And ultimately, when we do decide to do it, it is a massive gift as opposed to something that is largely considered a white entitlement right now. 
The next part is being able to act and take action when racist issues are coming up. And to understand, again, that if racism is occurring, if you're seeing it, if you're witnessing it, that that is part of your responsibility. It is not someone else's problem, it is my problem as well. And that is part of that linked fate, that is part of our empathy, that is part of our collective, our collective society. So ultimately, with white immunity, cool, last slide, so we're perfectly on time. Ultimately, with white immunity, partially what I argue is that, first of all, I think that it more accurately describes the dynamics of what's happening vis-a-vis -vis systemic racism and white supremacy uh, relative to uh, white privilege. And multi ultimately, I really can't stress enough the, 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 the idea of the empathy and connection, because all too often, it's very easy when you're of a, well, to use my term, an immune social identity, when you are not targeted by systemic racism, and we could even extend it to other ones, if you're not targeted by systemic patriarchy or systemic homophobia or systemic transphobia, et cetera, it is easy to intellectualize oppression. It is easy to keep it up here and away from here. And part of this connection requires us to feel and to sense and to feel each other and to understand the pain that is being caused in communities because of systemic racism. I saw way too many intellectual debates around the Dakota Access Pipeline that was going through sacred native uh, land. And folks, well, you know, it's just, I mean, it's everything sacred to Indian folk. Goodness me, what, you can't, it's like, you would never say that if it was your local cemetery that I was going to put a pipeline through. You would never say that if it was your backyard. And now that pipeline is leaking. And there is pain in that community as a result of it. There's oppression being experienced in those communities as a result of it. It is not an intellectual exercise, although I enjoy having scholarly arguments about this, but fundamentally it is a combination of intellect and the heart at the same time. And ultimately white immunity avoids a lot of the systemic, or the, the semantic issues of white privilege. It can sidestep that because it, it doesn't say what is happening to me as a white person, it asks what's happening in communities of color. But ultimately, and I'm gonna take the wind out of my own sails here because a lot of times when folks talk about race, race on campus, race in society as a whole, especially when we have a new idea, we kind of promote it. And all too often, again, it's like, hey, if you just take a can, if you just use my 10 steps, you'll cure racism tomorrow. And I want to be clear and loop all the way back around. Whether we're talking about white privilege or white immunity, it's still racism 101. It's still the jumping off point and not the end point. It's the racial equivalent of addition right now when in fact we need to be at a calculus level if we're gonna make substantial progress in society. And so that is my challenge to all of us collectively, is that if we're going to start with white immunity, if we're going to incorporate it into this canon, that it can't be an excuse, that, that some minor progress cannot become an excuse for complacency. Instead, it needs to be a jumping off point for much deeper engagement. And we can only do that collectively. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. I forgot to acknowledge someone else. I want to, um, before I introduce Dr. Um, Gina Garcia, I want to acknowledge Lauren, Lauren McDermott, who, let's give her a round of applause. She helped us uh, set up this event, and she is an amazing coordinator for, 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 for this. She made this event happen. So now I want to introduce and welcome Dr. Gina Ann Garcia, who is an associate professor in the de Department of Administrative and Policy Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research centers on issues of equity and justice in higher education with an emphasis on three areas that include Hispa Hispanic serving institutions, Latinx college students, and race and racism in higher education. 
Dr. Garcia has presented her work at many national conferences, including the American Educational Research Association, the, Associ the Association for the Study of Higher Education, the ACPA College Student Educators International. She is the author of multiple publications in top journals in her field, including the American Educational Research Journal, the Review of Higher Education, and the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. Additionally, Dr. Garcia has been invited to give talks about her research at over 20, probably more now, right? 20 um, colleges and universities across the country to share her expertise. Dr. Garcia has been the recipient of many awards, including the prestigious Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship and the National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship. People usually get one of those. She got both of them. <laughs> She is also the recipient of an Early Career Scholar Award from AERA's Latinx Research Issues Special Interest Group and the Ash CEP Mildred Garcia Award for Exemplary Scholarship. She is the author of this beautiful book here. She is the author of Becoming Hispanic Serving Institutions, Opportunities for Colleges and Universities, published by John Hopkins University. And this book was recently awarded the Book of the Year Award by the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education. Dr. Garcia earned her BA from California State University, Northridge, a master's degree in college student personnel services from the University of Maryland College Park, and her PhD in higher education and organizational change from UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Please help me welcome Dr. Gina Ann Garcia. I usually talk really closely to them. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We want to make, make sure I keep you awake. Thank you for keeping us awake for the first half. We've been going all day, so we definitely are starting to be like, woo, we need some caffeine. Um, so you got us as your caffeine, and hopefully we can get through uh, the next, uh, I guess we've got about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, so thank you for that introduction, and also thank you for inviting me, having me here. Um, I'm really excited uh, to share some work with y'all, and I'm going to time myself because we'll, I could talk for a long time. I'll just say I'll talk. I could talk for a long time, but we have 30 minutes, so I'm going to go through um, what they asked us to talk about was um, how we reframe research, right? How we sort of push back on, on normative ways of, of doing research. So I'm going to talk to you about the book, but specifically about how I think about reframing um, research in the book. Before we go on, I do want to recognize that we are visitors on the land and um, acknowledge the land and acknowledge that we are visitors on the ancestral lands of the Patwin people, which I know that uh, I did a quick Google search. Um, I do have an app. If, if you're interested, there's a, I have an app. And you can easily put the app on your phone to know what, what lands you are on. Um, always important to recognize that we are not um, the original owners of the land or people of the land. Um, but I do recognize also that uh, UC Davis is making steps to recognize the original ancestral lands of the Patwin people as well. So I appreciate that work. Um, I hope y'all will complicate what it means to be a land-grant institution in connection to um, the indigenous folks folks and how their land was taken, then there was a lot of land. This is a quick history lesson. Lots of land. Hmm, what do we do with those land? Justin Morrell raises his hand and say, I know, the land grants. Let's, let's give away land grants. Let's give away plots of land. And you should build world-class universities on these lands. Well, they became world-class universities on the land. And the land was actually not really anybody's to give away, but the original owners of the land. So it's a really interesting connection, I think, to land grants and the, um, you know, and, and the Morrill Act um, and how we moving to recognize um, that we aren't the original inhabitants of the land. So hope y'all will grapple with that. And I talk a lot, I started to talk a lot about that, even just thinking about what an HSI is. HSI is a federal designation. Land grant is a federal designation. They're both just federal designations. And people, for some reason, have a lot more trouble embracing the HSI identity because it's connected to the racial ethnic identity of people. Whereas land grants, like, yeah, land grants, it's great to be a land grant. We're a federally designated land grant, and we do land grant things, and we produce food on campus, and we have agriculture, and we can get USDA grants, and it's great to be a land grant. An HSI, hmm, we don't really know what that actually means, but it has Hispanic in it, and so that's problematic. 
right? Because Hispanic is problematic in this country when you have a president who likes to basically reinforce that narrative that it's, it's problematic to be Hispanic or Latinx or however you're going to identify in the large racial ethnic umbrella. So, um, so as y'all move to thinking about how you become an HSI, these are all the really important hard conversations that need to happen. Did it go out? Oh no, Nolan, you jinxed me, didn't you? He's like, turn it off. Um, I'll just keep talking and then I'm sure y'all will make it come back up eventually. Um, but these are the important conversations that need to happen as y'all start to think about what does it mean to be a Hispanic serving institution. It's so much more complicated than just, hey, we've reached 25% Latinx students and now we get to get federal funding. It's much more complicated. I've just given you at least three things to think about just at a basic level um, without really getting into what it means to become a Hispanic serving institution. So the book wasn't originally called Becoming Hispanic Serving Institutions, but I'm actually glad that me and my editor went back and forth on the name of the book. I, it, it's my title, I did come up with it, but it wasn't what I originally wanted it to be. But I'm glad it became this because, because Becoming is definitely the best word for becoming Hispanic servant institutions. Since most HSIs aren't born HSIs, they become, right? And so there's nothing wrong with becoming. That's actually a great thing. To grow, to evolve, to develop as people, if we think about it as people, is a great thing. That's why we go to college, right? That's why we, we come and we learn and we grow even just in four years at the university or sometimes two more years at a master's and sometimes four or five or six or eight or 10 as a doctoral student. Doctoral students know, and we just continue to grow and evolve as people, and that's a great thing, and we don't think anything bad about that, but this idea of becoming something that we weren't to begin with is like complicated. Like why is it so complicated that we could grow, right, and that we could become a new institution? Um, but that's exactly the way I think about this work, that becoming is a process. And so it's a process that I see institutions go two steps forward and three steps back on. Literally, that's how this work looks. For when I'm working really on the ground with folks, which I do, I'll be working with Colorado State University tomorrow, and I will promote their land recognition online. They have a video um, that recognizes their ancestral lands and their connection to being land grant. So check it out, because um, they're starting to think about these things already, about what does it mean to be an HSI, even though we're not one yet. Right? They're not one yet either. Are y'all yet? Y'all are like on that cusp, Joe, huh? Gosh, okay, here's my thought. <laughs> you are, all right, you have a critical mass like thousands of Latinx students. You are Hispanic serving. So all of that numbers game, that's just, it's just a number. All right, your students are gonna be here whether you hit 25% or not, they're here. They want you to serve them and they're connected to their communities that they came from, which are the local communities. And you need to think about how you start to recognize those communities as well in your work, right? So it's really, it's arbitrary, I think. 25% is super arbitrary. Could have been 20, it could have been 50, it could have been 100, but it's 25. And so we all strive for this 25, um, yet becoming is so much more complicated than actually hitting the number. So there you go. The expert on HSIs has said you're an HSI. <laughs> you're an HSI, go forth and do the work, okay? Don't worry about it, all right? It doesn't have to be so complicated to like be like, oh my God, are we, are we not? Did Excellencia say we are? Because they didn't put us on their list. People get really mad when Excellencia and Education doesn't put them on their list. It's like, this just, they, arbitrary list, y'all, arbitrary list. Do the work, right? Do the work, although I recognize the federal government wants you to be formally recognized to get the grant. So that makes, that makes sense as well. So what is this idea of a dominant narrative? I'm not gonna be able to go through the whole book, which is okay, because you can just, you know, buy the book, plug, that's what we do, we plug our books. We sell ideas, I always like to say we sell ideas, not books, although Nolan actually does sell books. Um, but we don't actually sell books for making money. We really are trying to sell ideas, right? We want you to think about, think, think critically about some of these really important concepts. So what is the dominant narrative? I will say the connection between the, the talk you just heard from Dr. Cabrera and mine is that we both do a lot of connection to history. All right, that'll be my first Takeaway. I don't know if I have a lot of takeaways. It's not designed to have takeaways, but one takeaway, because I thought it was interesting, is that we both do that, is that we have to spend time historically understand how we got to where we are, 
right? And if you don't actually spend time doing a critical analysis of how you got to where you are, it's kind of hard to realize how you got here, right? And it's also hard to disrupt where you're at if you don't actually recognize how you got here. Because this stuff is historical, it's systemic, it's legal, it's in our laws, it's, get, it's in place in all sorts of ways. And until we can disrupt all of those things, we're going to keep seeing it happen over and over again. So uh, with the book, I bring you into this idea that there's a dominant post-secondary narrative. Right? And it's like, OK, what is the post-secondary narrative? I frame the book around racialization. Now, chapter one of the book is, like, I think one of the funnest chapters to read, but it's also was like the funnest, is funnest a word? I don't know, it is, it's fun, it was fun. It was a really fun chapter to write because I got to think about what does racialization look like for institutions? Because typically this idea is at the individual level. I'm an organizational theorist, so I think what, is the thing, what does this look like for organizations? But as an organizational theorist, I also recognize organizations as acting similarly to people. They're live. They evolve, they transform, they become new things, they leave old identities behind. That's part of the process of being an organization, is they're actually live and they, 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 they change. Right, and that's okay. So I thought about racialization at the organizational level, and I'm like, well, what does this look like? And is this actually a real thing? Right, like, can I theoretically come up with examples of what it means to racialize an entire institution? Because that's what's happening when you take on the designation of Hispanic serving. Right, you cannot have this conversation without talking about race, because race is in the name or ethnicity, or pan-ethnicity. Hispanic is all kind of things, right? We, we know that. It's super complicated. I know. Maybe we don't want to be Hispanic serving, but it's what the federal government calls us, so just not that important. Again, arbitrary, kind of like the number, right? There's so much more important work to, to think about, right? So it's, a, it's connected to the pan-racial ethnic identity of your students, so it can't be done without race. And so there is a racialization, racialization process, yet we know that racialization, and when people um, make assumptions about race just by looking at them um, and, and immediately you know, put you in the box, um, or as Dr. Cabrera talked about, know exactly which side of the tracks you came from. I'll use tracks, right? Train tracks. Oh, you probably came from that side of the train tracks. You came from that side of the train tracks just based on how you look. Um, that's that racialization process. It's the things that we make assumptions automatically about people based on what they look like, right? And so we, I, what I do is I lift this up to this idea that that happens at or, the organizational level, yet it's a social construct. It's not fully real, so it could go all kind of different directions. So what happens as we think about racialization of institutions? And I thought about this a lot because I had to think about, could I really justify this argument? This is a hard argument to make, yet I found ways to make it in the book. Um, that's why I said it was fun to write it, to be like, well, how can I really justify um, that the institutions that we look to in this country, because we know in institutions of higher ed, post-secondary institutions in the United States, we very much have those that we aspire to the ones that we think are like the best ones in the country. And then there's a whole bunch that we don't even know their names. And guess what? A lot of those are HSIs. We literally don't know their names. There's like 5,000 post-secondary institutions in this country. And if I asked y'all to name as many as you could, you'd probably shout at least 10, maybe 15 or 20, but not 5,000. There's a whole lot of institutions you don't think anything about at all, yet they're doing good work and they're important and they're post-secondary institutions in this country. Um, but a lot of those names you probably would shout out were probably those much more elite ones. Um, and then what I talk about in the book as racially white. Um, and then I talk about racially minoritized institutions as what we typically call minority serving institutions. But because it's in this um, construct of racialization, I call it racially white, racially minoritized, right? So not predominantly white, not historically white, but racially white, right? That we just uh, automatically racialize institutions in that sort of way. So what happens um, in this process of racialization, what I saw in early research was that HSIs are undervalued. All right, so as I really got into this work as a grad student, as a doc student at UCLA, the narrative was just deficit, right? And so we know that there's deficit research about students of color, typically, and or minoritized students, right? It frames them as deficit, frames them as something's wrong. That's what was coming out with HSI research. Same exact thing, something's wrong, they're not graduating students equitably, they can't be, you know, they can't actually be Hispanic serving, they're just Hispanic enrolling. Hispanic enrolling became this sort of like, 
derogatory way to think about institutions. You're not actually an HSI. You're just Hispanic enrolling, right? It was a deficit. And I'm like, I, don't, I feel like if you enroll Hispanics, you're doing better than about 4,000 other institutions in this country, right? Because there's a whole bunch that aren't enrolling not a one. All right, so in Sp Hispanic enrolling or Latinx enrolling is actually not a bad thing. Right, that's the way I come to frame it, those of you that are familiar with the typology of HSI, is that it's not actually a bad thing to be Hispanic enrolling. It actually means you're providing access to a community that hasn't historically been having access to higher education. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to do the enrolling. But that's how I saw this research, was that HSIs were undervalued simply because the way we were framing them. Right? And so that to me was like, okay, this is what happens in this racialization process. Now, what I then go into is this like history. Like I said, we really have to think about history and why we think about the things we do um, as we're doing research, right? And really getting into to thinking about how we're framing research. And so I talk about in the book like this white narrative. Right? I'm like, well, why do we value white institutions? Well, if we read some of the like leading history books about um, post-secondary institutions, they're written by white people about white institutions and about white people. Now, I will say, I recognize that people of color didn't really start entering institutions of higher ed until much later. Institutions had been around a long time, right? And we really start to see the evolution of the compositional diversity um, of the student population only in the last like 30 years, really. Right, where we start to see a lot of people of color entering um, post-secondary institutions. So I recognize that, and so I, I recognize that that's why all the early research is about white people and white institutions and written by white people and oftentimes white men, but we have to think critically about that. Right, so yes, we recognize that history doesn't mean we have to keep retelling it and not rewriting it, right, and rethinking it, and rethinking why do these institutions not work for people of color? Well, because they aren't for people of color. None of the things we've written about were for people of color. We, want, we gotta stop thinking about it in white ways, right, or what I call in the book white normative ways. I'm also, like I said, an organizational theorist, so as I'm pulling on organizational theory, organizational theory is really cool and interesting because it's it's comes from other, outside. it comes from outside of education, it comes from um, organizational management, it comes from sociology, it comes from other areas, yet it's often about institutions of higher ed, right, the researchers are using into colleges and universities as their sites for doing research because Institutions of higher ed are fascinating organizations. They're fascinating, right? Probably some of the most fascinating and also long-standing institutions in this country, right? Harvard was founded in 1636 before we were actually a nation, right? As, as um, ships are landing on the shores with enslaved people and the, the, the institution of slavery is barely even coming up, right? Harvard's already there. Right, and of course, it's built on the backs of those of those of those enslaved people. We know that, and on the backs of indigenous people. But we know these institutions have been around a long time, so they're fascinating institutions. Yet again, written by white folks. The theory is written by white folks about white institutions and and about white things. So start to really reinforce this idea that that this is why we value white normative things because that's all we've ever known, right? And this is where those of us that do this more critical work, like me and Dr. Cabrera, we step in and say we can't keep retelling the same story. It's gonna keep telling us that we know the answer. We know the outcomes, right, already if we keep telling the same story and using the same, same sort of methods. Also talk about you know, early research on, with college students, same thing, white, white people doing research with white students at white institutions. We can't keep pulling on that. With the student session earlier, I was talking about sense of belonging and how I tell my students, I don't want, I don't want no more sense of belonging research. Why? Because I don't want to belong to your white institution, right? But sense of belonging definitely had its importance in time. I'm not saying it's not important. We do want to belong here, but we don't want to necessarily belong in the white spaces, right? How do we start to disrupt the white spaces, the normative spaces, and, and do something else, right? Let's, let's start to be more progressive um, with the way in which we interact in the university and start to make, it, make them ours, right? Start to stop just existing, stop just um, being here, but actually thriving, right? And thriving in our own ways the way we want to, not the way we, that we, uh, the institution has always traditionally believed we should. So the white practices start to come into play. I start to really dissect this in, in a lot of my work of, in working with the institutions of higher ed, what I do as HSIs are starting to think about how they become an HSI, this is one of the ones I spend a lot of time with. I'm like, you've got to change your structures, right? What do you teach? Let's start there. Every single student, in order to get a degree, 
has to go through the classroom. And it might not even be physical. We know students go through classrooms in, in virtual spaces, yet they've got to go through a classroom. They've got to go through some sort of curricular structure. So what's happening within those structures? Because typically we know if we're not thinking critically about what's happening in those spaces, those spaces will continue to value the white students, the white things, the white narratives, the white authors. And this essentially silences people of color within those spaces. And minoritized folks, right? People, lot, lots of different identities we're, we're silencing, um, yet I'm doing a racial analysis, so I'll keep talking about students of color, right? Who then feel marginalized in those spaces. Um, and I mean, it's a form of microaggressions. If we think about the different type of microaggressions, invalidation is one way in which we're aggressed. So when you don't see your narratives in the classroom, you're totally invalidated. You're like, well, my experience, I guess, is not that important, right? And that's where the work of ethnic studies, you know, which Nolan Cabrera has done a lot of work in that area as well, I write about as well, like the, the, the importance of ethnic studies is that people get to see themselves, right? They finally get to be like, whoa, it's my narrative, and I get to learn about myself, because we know that the spaces, the curricular spaces are silencing people of color. So that comes out in that, those spaces. Now, as I really get into like, well, what does this look like? And I'm, I'm thinking at the, about the whole field of higher ed this whole 5,000 institution. What does it mean to value these white standards? Well, it means we only value um, 62 institutions called AAU institutions. Those are the ones we like value um, in all sorts of ways, which again, subjective. <laughs> Some folks got together and said, us research universities, we're gonna found this thing called the American Association of Universities, and we are gonna have a like process where we admit institutions, and we also kick people out. AAU kicks people out. All right, there is a process of getting in and there's a process of getting out if you're not researchy enough, right? And we know the value of being an AAU and we know the value of becoming an AAUHSI because your neighbors down at Santa Barbara made sure to make it very clear they were the first AAU university, yet Arizona came in and said, we were, we were the second, but we're the first something, I'm sure. I'm sure y'all have come up with the first, we're the first something. Because we all want to be the first and the best, right? So we're the first or the second AAU, meaning we're the best elite HSI. Problematic. Problematic that we're going to start to value HSIs, that there's some that are better than the others. Because guess who's going to come out at the bottom? Community colleges. That's how the system's designed. The system is designed to, that the community colleges are going to come out at the bottom. How many of you work at community colleges? I know there's some group over here. Yes, community colleges are working way harder than any other institution. Let's just be clear about that, right? They are admitting students who the system has basically said is not going to survive, not going to make it. And in some ways, you know, the community colleges have been designed to, we've heard, call out those students. Well, just go to a community college and hopefully you'll transfer. But if you don't, well, you know. We offered you a little bit of post-secondary, and, and that happens. We, if you see the number, students don't get out of community colleges, and students of color and low-income students really don't, right? 10 minutes, okay, got 10 minutes, awesome. Um, and so we know that that's what happens, and this is this hierarchy of institutions. And so for me, I worry, and Dr. Cuellar worries, because we've talked about this for a long time, we have saw this coming, that this was gonna happen with HSIs, that there was gonna be a valuing, so when we see Santa Barbara jump in and say, we're the first AAU HSI. <laughs> we predicted that 10 years ago. We knew that that was going to happen, that that was going to be this value in. And so a lot of it is connected to these white standards, right? That what is it good about institutions of higher ed, right? And so I pull, I love, if you have not read Alexander Aston's book, that's my um, scholar grandpa, by the way. We were talking about scholar lineage earlier. Scholar grandpa, you know, so I love Alexander Aston um, and his work, yet his work has like zero race in it. So I pull on this book to talk about my book, yet I'm like, yet he does no racial analysis. So he talks about why institutions are more prestigious and basically because we value quote unquote smart and he uses quotes quote unquote smart students quote unquote smart faculty um, which again arbitrary totally socially constructed and totally made up on how we decide who's smart right smart is determined by SAT and ACT scores and GPA that's it we know that those measures are not the best measures for people of color they're discriminatory in many ways, tests, we know that. I mean, there's such a large national conversation about getting rid of tests at the GRE, at the graduate level for sure. That's where all the conversation is going on because we know they're not actually the best indicators of whether you're going to succeed and or the best indicators of how quote unquote smart you are, right? So we're using these to value and SATs is actually the best indicator of selectivity of the institution. 
All right, so the students are determining how selective the institution is. So if we wanna be more selective, we're gonna find smarter, quote unquote, smarter students. That's all we gotta do. We just gotta go across the tracks to the other side where the quote unquote smarter students are, quote unquote, all the quote unquotes, meaning the white students, the white schools, the white places that all are doing the things that are gonna get us higher standards, right? Higher selectivity in our, in our, um, you know, in our rankings. Smart faculty, as Alexander Aston refers to it, are the ones that do research, get grants, publish, write books, you know, all the things that get us uh, tenure at the AAU universities, that those of us are AA universities, we do it because we know that's what's going to get us tenure, and that, that then reflects how smart the institution is. Us, faculty, again, totally arbitrary things. Doesn't mean we're the smartest faculty at all. It just means we follow the rules, right? It just means we know how to act in the white normative ways. It doesn't mean we value those things. It just means we have learned how to play the game. We've learned how to exist, because that's what we do. People of color, minoritized people, that's what we do. We learn how to you know, sort of navigate in all the different worlds. So all this to say this is how we determine how good, quote unquote, or effective institutions are, yet graduation rates, which is a good indicator of how effective you are, are determined also by student characteristics. All right, lots of statistical models have been run, lots of higher ed research. We look at which students are likely to go to college and which ones are likely to graduate, and it's often based on students' income, their high school of origin, their mother's education level, SAT, ACT scores, all student level variables, not institutional level variables. So this is where my early head was, was like, how are we determining HSI effectiveness on things like graduation rates when all of those things are based on the student, not the institution? How do we start to measure what the institution does? Because the institution can have an effect, but it hasn't been a large enough effect because it doesn't come into the statistical models. The mother's education level is a much stronger predictor of whether or not you go to college than what the institution does, or the high school, right? That's wild, and if you're, if you're a mom, it puts a lot of pressure on you. <laughs> I'm a mom, and I'm like, well, first of all, I'm like, well, I got a PhD, my kids are good. They don't even have to go to school, it's fine. You're gonna go to college. Look, yeah, you got me, I'm your mom, right? wild, but it's based on the mom, but also we know moms do a lot of, pulling from Chicana feminist theory, pedagogies of the home. Moms do a lot of stuff. Moms also advocate for their kids in ways that they nobody else does, right? They show up and they advocate for their kids. They say, darn it, my kid needs to be in, in this you know, magnet program because they do, because my kid is smart. Just because you're stupid tested and say it did, that they were smart doesn't mean they're not smart, right? Because they know. So these are the things that we're dealing with, that they, these are based on student level variables and not the institution at all. So the outcomes is that institute, HSIs are generally broad access institutions, and broad access institutions generally have between a 32 and a 62% graduation rate, whereas the most selective institutions have much higher, 70 to 88%. I was at Marquette University last week, love Marquette, they're an emerging HSI, they're actually a striving, they're only like at 14%, and their graduation rate is like 78%. Right, and I'm like, yep, 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 you can't base this on graduation rate, right? Because your students are telling me they're having bad experiences, so you gotta start thinking outside the box. It can't be graduation rates, because you've already admitted students are likely gonna graduate from your institution, right? So it can't be that, and so this is how we're seeing, you know, the overall um, narrative in higher ed play out. HSIs, by the way, their average graduation rate is 39%, so much lower than even the average of all institutions, which is 56%. So if we're saying that this is gonna determine how effective an HSI is, it's not the most effective. It can't be based on student level outcomes or student level variables, because this is your students at HSIs. They're students of color, they're low income, first gen to college, first gen to the US, part-time enrollment, underprepared for college maybe, determined by normative standards, maybe lower SAT and ACT scores and lower math scores. And if you wanna read the article where I got all these data, read Dr. Cuellar's article, because she found all of this. Right, yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a definitely, uh, I pull on her research all the time, right? Her research informs my research for sure. Um, but these are the, and so there was an earlier article that found these same things and she found, you know, like what, six or seven years later after um, Anne Marie's article, same, same characteristics of the students, right? And so these are your students. You can't base how effective you are based on your students if we know they're coming in with, with variables that are gonna less likely to lead to graduation, right? You gotta start to think, these are our students, what are we gonna do? 
Uh, so the dominant narrative is also, you know, we have to, we have to remember historical context because it often forgets the historical context. Um, and Dr. Cabrera did a great job of outlining some of that historical context. And I do some of this in some of my work of like, well, why are Latinx students often failing, right? They're coming from segregated schools. They've been discriminated against based on wild things historically, like their hygiene, right? How dark their skin is. I mean, we, we've come up with all sorts of ways, language, whether or not they can speak um, English, that's wild because smart people speak all kind of other languages besides English. English is not a determinant of how smart you are, but in the United States, we've decided that that was a determinant. If you can't speak English or not, probably not that smart. Mm, wrong, right? But all of these sort of things get forgotten in the in the dominant narrative. Um, the dominant narrative, interestingly, I love Nick Vargas's work. I like to I like to recognize scholars who are doing really cool work. Nick Vargas um, found like he did an analysis of those HSIs that are getting grants, the federal grants, and he found that. The people who are writing these grants, who are the people on campus who are saying, we're going to write this grant because we want to do better by our students, are coming up with the most deficit narrative about their students to get the grants. That is problematic. If we say, our students are so deficit, then maybe we'll get federal money. That's problematic. OK, so who do I write most of my work for? The federal government. Because I'm like, you need to change. You need to recognize that that shouldn't be the reason why people are getting federal grants, because your students are so deficit. No, our students are so amazing. And they're low income, and they're students of color, and they're, they're, they speak multiple languages. And all of that is valued here at our institution. And we want you to give us money to, uh, to enhance those things. Right, that's the narrative we should be saying, not like, oh, they're so low income and poor, and they have low grades. Nah, we got to disrupt that dominant narrative. Oh, I'm gonna skip that one because I'm almost out of time. Uh, so I talk about, you know, just basically start to get at in the in the um, in this idea of the indicators of effectiveness can't be based on those normative standards, right? And that's why I talk about that grant process because, like, really, the federal government is continuing to recognize the normative standards. So I talk about sense of belonging. We've been talking about sense of belonging forever. If you write a grant for the federal government, they're like, oh yeah, sense of belonging, it's so good. And I'm like, no, right? I want them to start thinking outside the box. Right, I want them to start funding those grants that are thinking outside the box and not rewriting the not normative narrative because it just doesn't reflect whether or not you're actually an HSI. Um, Nick Vargas also uh, published an article that found that um, the, the institutions that are likely to get federal funding are actually quote unquote whiter HSIs, meaning their white population is larger, right? Because there's that. That's a really important concept that like you might have 25% Latinx and 75% white. Those institutions are more likely to get the federal grants, right? So again, what's being valued? Whiteness, race, right? We can't take do this analysis and this work as an HSI minus race because it's just so, so important. Uh, institutional diversity at HSIs, I think the biggest thing I want you all to take away is that you have to, as you start to think about this work, you have to think about how you're going to do this work as a kind of institution you are. Because there's so many different types of HSIs that you can't say, well, I want to be HSI down the street. I don't want to be Sac State down the street because Sac State and you are different, right? And I don't want to be Sac City College because they're different. Right, so you all might be an HSI, yet you do very, very different work historically. So you need to think about what does it mean to be a research, top research university. I know I don't want to like you know create this hierarchy, but we're a research university, we're a land grant, you know, we're we're historically these different things. A uh, uh, UC, right, a state institution. What does it mean to be that kind of HSI? That's what I want the work to do be done that's here, right? As you start to think about this and not look for models, although if you want one, I think Santa Cruz is doing some good work, so I'm gonna point to them. I do like the work that Santa Cruz is doing. They've, they've been doing this work for a couple years and they're doing good work, so I will point to one of your at least sister campuses, um, a, a, somebody that is at least like you, right? And they're really thinking about what does it mean to be a racially just research university? That's what you wanna start thinking about, right? One that's committed to equity and justice, not whatever you've you know always been committed to, which is typically white normative things. So I'm going to stop there and shut it down. Thank you. Did I get the challenge? Oh, I, I saw before the challenge. Thank you. That was um, amazing. And so um, it's my pleasure. My name is Mikal Kurlander. I'm a faculty member and chair at the School of Education. And just want to add my welcome um, to everyone for this evening. And again, a round of applause for our first two speakers. 
I'm actually going to invite Dr. Uh, Garcia and Dr. Um, Cabrera to come up for a moderated conversation that's going to be uh, moderated by our very own Professor Cuellar. Um, and I just wanted just a few words of introduction uh, for my colleague, Professor Cuellar, um, who I'm pleased to announce the newly tenured associate professor. <laughs> You can stand up, that's right. <laughs> yes, you're getting us. So, um, so, yeah, please, you can come join. I'll just, and I'll just want to, I just want to say she is our own, um, yes, take yeah, get your water. Yeah. Um, our own um, expert scholar in higher education in, at the School of Education and um, does not shy away from a lot of the issues that have already been discussed this evening um, and is my personal thought partner on all things higher ed. Um, and and, and for, for folks who don't know, not only is she a scholar of higher education, but has done a lot of work for this university as it is in its becoming an HSI. And so we also just want to thank her as members of the UC Davis community for all the work that she's done uh, for this campus and will continue to do providing expertise across the country to institutions um, that are doing this very important work. And so all of her work is about supporting the students that, um, that we're talking about this evening and that, and that, um, and that so, um, and that she cares so deeply about. And, and I think what's important about Professor Criar's work is that she also embodies it in the classroom. And I know a lot of her students are here today. Yes, yeah, so, um, so please join me in, in welcoming her to the, po I don't know what to call it, to our round little uh, session here. And she's gonna take it over from here. So thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. So we wanted to kind of have a moment to just engage in a little bit of a dialogue, given all of the important work that um, Dr. Cabrera and Dr. Garcia just presented and kind of having a broader conversation about higher education. Um, I think we revel when we have higher ed scholars here and really want to kind of grapple with some of the things. But I just want to also just personally say, um, you were talking about academic lineages. And so we are actually part of the same academic lineage and academic siblings, if you will. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I am the numerically oldest. <laughs> Sibling love, right? Sibling love. <laughs> but he is the baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So I just have, I'm going to, you know, I want to make sure that we also leave time for folks to ask you questions because you have folks who really have um, important questions to ask you. But I think I'm going to just have three questions that I want to get your thoughts on. So you're, you're both really challenging some of these dominant narratives, challenging us to think about white supremacy, race, racism, and higher education, which is embedded, right, from day one in these institutions when they were developed. But I'm, I'm wondering, as you're, as you're you know, kind of going around the country, raising these issues across colleges and universities, where do you see the greatest resistance kind of in challenging these ideas and really trying to push beyond them? And so I want you to kind of think about that within the academy itself, but also within institutions. Like, where do you see the greatest pushback or challenge? Oh, can you hear me? The white guys on campus are the most, I know, I was going to steal it from you. I stole it from you. No, but I'm just kidding. They're actually not always the most um, resistant. Um, so when I do work with HSIs, I most of the time get to talk to what I call the choir, right? The folks who are already committed to this work. And it's like all the people who don't show up, those are the resistors, right? Just by not showing up. By showing up today, y'all are actually you know, making a claim about you support this idea of challenging dominant narratives and the folks who didn't, maybe they just couldn't get here for, you know, whatever reason, but some of them just don't come because they actually don't really want to think about this, that this is hard work to do. Um, and so the biggest question I get when I visit campus is actually, how do we get all the people to the room that aren't here, which is basically everybody else, right? It's like a small percentage that actually show up and actually care and want to do this work. Um, and I think that's a hard question to grapple with, is like, how do we get everybody to show? Because a lot of people are resistant to change. But like, doing the same thing is easy. Right, we all know how to do this. We've been doing it. We've been like socialized to go to school and take tests, right? Like I, I remember when I first really started um, like teaching, uh, at, you know, master students at the grad level and not doing lecturing. One of the first things that I got like over and over again in my in my um, 
in my, what is it, course evaluations, yeah, was like, Dr. Garcia really needs to lecture more. And I'm like, why? Like, what What the heck? That's not even good pedagogy, right? Like, I'm like breaking y'all in a groove. You know how hard it is to be out, think outside the box? Like, I could stand and talk at y'all for two and a half hours, sure. But that's not really great for your learning, right? And it's like over and over again, it's like we're socialized and we want that. Right? And so to the point where students will be like, but we just want you to lecture, right? And we'll take notes, because that's what we do, right? Why are you making us like answer questions online, you know, like different, there's different ways to, to engage students. And, and it's just like, it's easy to do the same thing. It's hard to think outside the box and do the things. And so I think that's what, you know, I would say is like, basically, almost everybody is pretty much resistant. That most folks are thinking, I don't know that I, I'm, I'm totally on board with you, but I'm not sure I'm ready or even know how to do it. So thinking about it as, from an institutional analysis, the higher up that you go, the more that people individually have succeeded by the old school metrics. And yeah, that does tend to map onto issues of race and gender and class, sexual orientation, et cetera. But there's also this thing that what's seen as threatening by a lot of what we're proposing is that we're saying, you probably didn't get there just of your own merit. And a lot of it is this personal, like, no, I want to recreate the same system that got me to where I am right now. And that's actually why it's so hard to find transformative leadership and actually why I don't invest a lot of time and energy in that. And I actually derive a lot of... Um, I derive a lot of strength from the, the lessons of the 60s because exactly what uh, Dr. Garcia, I'm just gonna call you Gina. I know, I know you too long, I, it, it's too formal. You're more, yeah, I'm like, no, 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 it's Marcella, Gina, Nolan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or Ro, that's a whole different thing. But um, I, we get asked that a lot. How do we get the people who are not in the room to the table? And there's always this thought about like, we have to get everybody on board. Well, the 1960s, we misremember it very badly. There was some massive institutional change through social disruption that was not 50.1% of the institution, 50.1% of society agitating for these things. It was a very concerted, collective, intentional group that was trying to disrupt and then also transform and create a better society in the process. And so, you know, on the one hand, I, I, you know, with that question, it can actually add to an effective strategy because you're trying to convince someone who's just not going to be convinced. When in fact you need the, you know, you need to get people who are interested in saying we need to do things in a different way. And not all different ways are equally effective. I need to be clear about that. Just because something's different, our current president is different. That doesn't make it better. There's a whole, anyway, don't want to go, just remember that. Not all change is good. But the point being that it doesn't take everybody being on board. It takes a concerted effort by a critical mass of people. And so if we are always trying to get that person who's not going to be on our team anyway, I get this all the time. If you were just a little less angry or a little less loud or a little less fill in the blank, I'd totally be on your side. So I tone it down and what happens? Crickets, exactly, yeah. So the point being that there's a strategic component to it where at some point, I'm not going to convince you, but we can create enough pressure within our institution to actually agitate in these areas. So I, I do want to go to kind of a question that I, I'm thinking, you know, about you just mentioned kind of like the current context and our current political climate in this country. And I'm wondering how do you think kind of the, the current tensions or challenges that we see outside of the university, knowing that these percolate into the institution, what challenges or opportunities does this raise for us to like create some transformative change? I shouldn't turn it off. Um, I think the current context makes it challenging uh, to do this work, right? And I agree, definitely, the, you, you know, you don't need everybody on board. Um, change often happens because of social movements, right? Like it's, that, that's, how, that's how the HSI designation actually came about. The federal government didn't just say, hey, you know what, we should like designate these institutions that are under-resourced and serving Hispanic students, HSIs. No, historically there was a 
fight. There was movement for about 20 years before that, that designation actually came on board. People who were so committed to it that they continued and they rewrote bills and they, they lobbied legislators, right? Like that's how change happens, right? And so, yeah, we're, we're not going to like not, you know, we, we need to be committed to that. Um, but the current context, uh, what I'm finding is that it's like it almost makes it allow, like we're allowed to to continue to be problematic, right? It makes it a little bit harder to get folks um, on board because, you know, there are problematic things going on and people are kind of like, eh, well, you know, there's racism. Yeah, there's racism, but doesn't mean that we should allow it to happen, right? Doesn't mean that it's okay. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't start to disrupt it um, just because it's happening and just because we see it happening at the federal level, right? From our leader, uh, the leader of the free world is, is, is reinforcing this sort of thing. Um, so I think it does make it challenging in that sense, but also makes it easier, a little easier because it's so like tangible, right? So we're e it's easy to say, well, yo, right now is the time. Right, if there's gonna be movement, now is the time. Because look at what's happening at a national level. So it makes it in some ways easier to do because then people are like, yeah, something's gotta change, right? There's, there's got to be change, there's got to be positive change. Because yeah, change isn't always good. How do we make it um, positive? So. So playing off of that, I think that what the current administration has done is a lot of that racism that was percolating just beneath the surface that for the longest time people were like, we're really almost a colorblind society. It really ripped the veil away from that. We can no longer hide under that illusion and it does in some way make the work a little, in, this is gonna sound horrific, but it does make it a little bit easier because the beginning part in the mid 1990s, you couldn't make an argument like this because it was like, no, 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 you know, we had the 60s, we're post-racial, you know, things are gravy, we're good to go. And now you're saying, no, 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 people were being very politically correct in mixed company, but there was this extraordinarily racist vein throughout society that's just right there. But I'm going to take the question in a slightly different direction. And one of the things that I think is really important to consider in this specific point in time is... Folks are, on, especially communities of color and marginalized communities as a whole, are really under a lot of pressure for a variety of reasons. You know, the, the, taking away protection for trans people, kids in cages, racial profiling, all these different things that are, that are just being amped up to the nth degree. And the reason why I bring that up is that when we're under pressure, it's very easy to lash out at those who are nearest to us. And I've seen more conflict among folk who are very, very like-minded. And under some very progressive principles, you know, this person might progress me in this way or that. But when we look at the response and the reaction, and it, this is very difficult because I don't want to diminish a lot of the context, that, or the, a lot of the critiques that people are lodging. But I think a lot of us need to do some very serious looks at ourselves and where we're at emotionally. Because when you're simmering at a nine, it just takes one little thing to push you to a 10. And you know, when you're really lashing out hard against something and it seems sort of disproportionate, I think we need to be able to kind of take each other into account. Not in like a call out way, because I really don't have a lot of patience for that, but in a very loving, caring way and saying, I think we may be hurting more than we're actually recognizing. And we need to do a lot more self-care on that. Because in a lot of times, we're, almost cannibalizing each other and really doing harm to each other because we're not doing the self-care. So that's sort of a challenge that I have both for myself as well as for y'all to do that so that, because in the absence of that self-care, any of these movements and agitations, they fall apart because we end up lashing out of the person who's closest to us. It's like your boss yells at you at work so you come home and yell at your partner, right? It's just that on a massive scale. So sort of a, a thought, a challenge, and just something to think about and, and ponder as we're moving ahead. So I wanted to pick up on a question or something that you um, also started to um, raise, Gina, about r really recognizing that the University of California is quickly becoming an HSI system, mm -hmm. um, where five of our undergraduate campuses are already HSIs. We're soon to become the sixth HSI. And so, 
And I know that as a research institution, land-grant institution, we were kind of in a unique group of the landscape of HSIs. And uh, Nolan, you're at the University of Arizona that is a HSI research institution. And so I'd like for you to kind of share what you think, like, th this intersection of HSI designation and research institution, like, what, what does that mean for how we live out our missions? And um, what does that mean, like, at the institutional level and down to, like, even the college or department level? As I think about what it means to be a research HSI, and there's only a handful, there are, you know, University of New Mexico has been an HSI for a very long time. Um, University of Texas San Antonio been an HSI for a very long time. There are, um, you know, research institutions that are HSIs. UIC, I'm trying to name them all. UIC, University of Illinois Chicago is a research institution that recently became an HSI. Um, and so I think we need to start thinking critically because I don't know that those institutions, even the ones that have been long time, um, have thought much about the fact that for me, if research is your driving thing and that that's what you do, it's you know what you are known for and historically have always been, you need to continue to do that. Yeah, how do you do research for equity and justice, right? For racial justice. And that has to happen across the institution, right? It can't just be in the School of Ed. We know schools of ed, we're a little bit more progressive, right? We're like, we're leading the change, we're pushing the change, I, I think. You know, I'm a little biased, obviously, as an education scholar, but we, we, we're we really starting to push, right, people to think about this. Um, but it's got to happen in the School of Engineering. It's got to happen in social work. It's got to happen in the law school. It's got to happen in the medical school. It's got to happen all across the entire institution that we start thinking, what does it mean to do research within four communities, our local communities, um, and for equity and justice? Right, and I have people often ask me, well, what does this look like in STEM? STEM, like if I could answer the STEM HSI question, <laughs> I would, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't get a million dollars, but I, people would invite me to do talks or something, I don't know, which I already do, but I'm like, I don't know how to be a good STEM HSI because I'm not actually a bench scientist, right? I don't, I'm not a physicist, I'm not, you know, I'm not, whatever it may be that falls under that STEM, I'm not an engineer. Y'all need to think about that. Right, what is equity and justice? I feel like engineers could be the leaders of equity and justice, right? What does it look like to do like justice with the land and justice with the environment and justice with local communities? Engineers like can be thinking of that. And that's where that's where it needs to start to move, right? That equity and justice needs to be back for the people and the local community. HSIs are a reflection of their local communities. We can't like dismiss that. Right, the patterns of admission and enrollment of Latinx students, the research tells us that they're likely to go close to home. They're not likely to go very far from home for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't want to, but also maybe their families don't want them to. Right, they're like, yeah, you're, you need to be home before the lights, you know, the street lights come on, right? and come take home care of your sister. Right, like you got to get home because you know you got responsibilities at home to be with the family. Right, there's there's important connection to family, and not all Latinx students, but you know we know that's generally um, part of the community cultural wealth. And so our our our, our HSIs actually reflect local communities. Right, and so we have to start to think about how do we do equity and justice as a research institution for the local community, right? We talked about this earlier, actually, as we were meeting um, with Dr. Lopez about like how I joked that the, um, the catering at an HSI has to actually have Latinx food, right? Like real, right? And then we went on to say, what if the catering moves to actually hiring local, local mom and pops? Right, that it's not your Sudoku or whoever y'all use. They are not the ones that are like, we could come up with that. We can make tamales. Just give us a couple days, right? And then they give you something, and it's got random like raisins in it, right? And you're like, what? Like, what the? What? Why is there raisins? <laughs> like, I'm not sure what this is. Why is there lettuce in my tamales, right? Like, there's no lettuce in tamales, right? So, like, we need to be like engaging our local communities, right? That's what for me, my dreamy HSI. That's HSI. Right, that we would actually be committed to the local community and uplifting those communities. That is a land grant research HSI to me. So I think that a lot of our institutional leaders, when they get that HSI designation, they see it as an end point. It's a celebration, it's a gold star, it's a badge. And actually, when we got out of the U of A, that's how they were they were dealing with it. They were saying, you know, look at how great we are. And actually what that became was a public way for us to shame our institution because our local, high, our local school district is almost 70% Latinx. So it's not, oh, look at how great we are. We're an HSI. 
It's why the heck didn't we get this 10 years ago? Because we've been spending more money doing outreach to Abu Dhabi and California. And like the U of A has its slogan down, you know, hey, you didn't get into Berkeley, UCLA or Davis? Come over here. We'll give you a world class education for cheap. And it's like, and we cater to them constantly. We're actually facing a $20 million budget fall because we've been taking your all students. Like, that's a whole different issue altogether. <laughs> but the point being that it's a jumping off point for actually continuing to pose this question to our institutions. What is, we cannot, you know, you want to embrace the status and you want to actually do it in a meaningful way, then you need to change the way that things are going. You actually need to invest in it. You can't just take the dollars and be that closeted HSI. You really need to actually embrace this identity and say, no, this is the, this is the direction of the future. And what Gina was saying is huge because you know what? It's not just the Latinx students like, it, it, it tend to stay close to home, but we also tend to find social relevance really important in choosing a, a major. And when the STEM fields don't directly relate, that's huge. And, but you know what? The environmental justice movement has been huge. You incorporate that into the STEM fields. I mean, we have a massive TCE spill, so people on the south side of Tucson, the brown side of Tucson, are getting poisoned on a regular basis. We had, there was the gold mine spill through na na the Navajo Nation where the water turned yellow. You have the Flint, Michigan lead in the water. Each one of these is the intersection of a racial justice coupled with a STEM focus. And each, these are not mutually exclusive ideas. As a matter of fact, when the federal government comes in and doesn't have an ethnic studies orientation, doesn't know the community, doesn't engage with the community in a meaningful way, they end up screwing up even worse because there's no faith in the people who are trying to help. There's no engagement with them. And their work in public health and cleaning up the environment, it doesn't go anywhere because they're culturally incompetent. This isn't a convenient add-on to what they're doing. It is the crux of what they should be doing as a profession. So all too often, they, folks keep saying, well, you know, HSI status, it's cute. We're gonna get a couple million dollars more in federal grants. No, it's a challenge to us as an institution. And then our work becomes the ones to amplify that challenge, to continually say, here is what we need to do as a group. And what are you as an institution? What are you as institutional leaders actually doing to serve this community and to really change our organization? Because a lot of our values are arbitrary. They say, oh, you know, you're going to get tenure because you did service, research, and teaching. There's nothing that says you can't say, what have you done to fulfill our HSI mission? And that's part of the tenure promotion and review process. If that's an institutional value, then you have to set up a reward structure to reflect that. What has your department, as a chair of that department, done to actually increase the proportion of Latinx students pursuing this major? What have you, as a dean, done to diversify your faculty? I, as provost, will not release more lines to you until you have actually done something like that, until you have a strategic plan in place that centers diversity, not as a convenient add-on, but as the crux and the core of what you are doing. And so the underlying idea is that everything that we take as static as institutional values, we have to reframe as arbitrary and then re put, uh, and then re look at those and say, here's what we need to value as an institution because this is what we're going to value and this is the future of our, uh, of our institution. We can't keep doing things the same old way. It's that old adage about the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If it's the status quo, we're going to keep going in the same way. It ain't going to work. Right now, we're actually talking about more of a real social transformation. It's kind of like a, an academic version of FUBU, for us, by us. That's what we're looking for. Thank you. So I want to make sure that we open up time for questions. Um, so does anybody have a question? Hi, my name is Sergio. Um, I'm guess I'm curious about the beginning process to like getting a doctorate because y'all are studying some pretty critical things, especially at the institutional level. And I'm assuming someone has to approve of your research before you actually do it. So how exactly does that conversation start? And what was your take on that? 
uh, my advisor told me repeatedly not to do this research. <laughs> And then after winning two book awards for white guys on campus, she said, okay, I think I might have made a mistake on that. She never admits that she's wrong, so I held that one. That was like 10 years in the making. I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, yeah, hold this, please. Yeah, right. The underlying idea, though, is a lot of times going into the PhD, there's this idea of where research becomes me-search, where there's a social problem or something that's not quite clear in your life, and you're trying to make sense out of it by doing empirical research. Not saying that you already have the answers, but that I have this passion around issue X. It's actually somewhat arbitrary to your own personal narrative, but when there's a passion around it, when there's something that's really important to you and drives you, it makes it so that you can, I mean, doing a PhD is it's an unnatural process. You know, you're sitting there by yourself reading books, you end up talking to yourself, and talking to yourself is never a good thing. It just, you're sitting in your room going, oh my God, I'm working through this theoretical paradigm, blah, 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 you know, and it's, it, you know, you, you, your eyes get shot, you're all hunched over, you're, you know, you're getting carpal tunnel, but the passion, you have this purpose, like I am researching something that's really relevant to me, people in my community, people who are like me, people who, something that's really structured around what, how, issues that are core to who it is that I am. And that passion can drive you in it. Now you have to do the sound empirical work at the same time and take the time to get the training, but that passion can drive you through a lot of that. It can make it so that, it can make it a little bit more manageable in that process. And so a lot of the people who I've seen done, do really well in the PhD start with the passion, then work to the technique so that you can get to that next step. But then you have to find people who will be able to support you in it. And if you see it as one gatekeeper, as your advisor, it's not going to work. You need advisory by constellation. You need someone who will be able to support you here, 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 in a lot of different ways, and be able to get those folks in place. And you have to be very proactive about that to identify what you want to do, how you want to do it, and most importantly, how these people can fit a specific role in that. Stand up. Hi, um, my name is Emily, and um, my question is around us um, kind of like being on the verge of becoming an HSI. So I think it's like, you know, last time I checked, we had 25% um, of Latinx students, and I think that's really great. You know, I'm a Latina myself, um, but I can't help but also feel, I don't want to say like guilty, but kind of guilty because we also only currently have like 4% black students, and I think 1% indigenous students. So do y'all think that there is a way that like we can use this HSI title to kind of like help increase the admission rates of indigenous and black students as well? You know, like how can we use this kind of privilege that we're getting to bring them up with us? Yes. So that's probably the second most common question I get. The STEM thing always from STEM faculty who are like, I don't know how to do this, Gina. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And that question always comes up. Um, so absolutely. And I typically frame the HSI narrative around justice and equity and the serving of minoritized populations rather than strictly Hispanic or Latinx um, for a variety of reasons. But for one, folks feel uncomfortable about thinking about serving only one population, particularly in California. Post 209, we never never focus on one race, right? Like we're in a, a anti-affirmative action state. We know that I've been like that for a very long time. Um, and so, so nobody feels comfortable about that, right? And so I often frame it as like, we've got to think outside. And that's why, as I talked about, that this is a connected to racial ethnic identity of your students. Um, and therefore you can talk about race. Right, so you should be talking about race of all your students. Um, and, and that means black students on, I've yet to come across an HSI that has a larger black population than the Latinx population, um, because the black population typically is, I don't know, anywhere from like one to maybe eight would be a high. Like a high percentage at HSI is typically about eight to 10. There's a few um, in Texas that have a higher uh, population. But yeah, so we have to have that conversation. Another important conversation we have to have is also about what anti-blackness looks like at an HSI. 
And that's really super complicated because there are Afro-Latinos in your population. And we know, and all of y'all are head nodding, that the Latino population has not been good about dissecting what it looks like to be anti-black in our own community. Right, and so we've probably, all of us have witnessed them, somebody in our community being anti-black, right, or just straight up racist, right? And so it's within our own community, and we, we have to recognize the diversity of Latinx students, that Latinx students do encompass, um, you know, African, Afro, African roots, Latinos with African roots, right? And that con is connected to settler colonialism, which it, it includes um, indigenous folks, settlers, and also the bringing of enslaved people. Right, so those are all connected, and so it makes all the sense in the world why why our, our people have African roots, right? They do, many of them do, particularly for, from the Caribbean, right? But all through Latin America as well. Um, and so we, we have to have critical conversations about what it means for our own communities, um, even when we're thinking Latino community, uh, that, that there's anti-blackness in our own community, but the larger university, what does anti-blackness look like? Um, I you know recognize land when we first started. We also have to have bigger conversations conversations than recognizing land, right? What does it mean to actually create spaces for native populations and native communities that are not historical, that are living in our communities today, right? And so what does that look like to, to make sure that we're, we're creating spaces and having critical conversations about those communities as well? So yeah, absolutely, API, uh, we need to have API <laughs> included in that. There are HSIs that are also anapesies. Um, I want to say SAC, not SAC, are y'all? Yes, SAC State is one of those. And Apesias is an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. Um, and then we got to disaggregate Asian and API, right? Because there's a lot of communities that are minoritized within the API umbrella, right? And are we, are we adequately serving those students? Are we adequately thinking about, um, you know, our Hmong students? I was in, I was in the, um, the Midwest and they talk a lot about Hmong students, right? At these HSIs, they're like, we gotta talk about our Hmong students. Um, are we talking about uh, Filipino students, right? Are we having those conversations about, about different communities? So absolutely, I think it's a great time to bring it in. Um, and that's why I really stress the idea that HSI is just a federal designation. The meaning you attach to it is what's important. It's just a federal designation. You got to get beyond that. Just a federal designation. Now what do we do? And then really quickly off of that too, I think it's a really important consideration in the sense that in striving for this designation, it's very easy for institutions to pit different minoritized groups against each other, in particular because it's like, well, let's say you're Afro-Latino. Well, I'm only going to mark you as Hispanic so that we can do that. So what ends up happening is you have an, an undercounting of other minoritized groups because of that. So then you end up with the black faculty going, whoa, 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 we have more black students than that, and there should be more resources. And the re university says, no, there's only a couple of folk over here like that. And again, it becomes sort of us picking at crumbs, and so it's really important, even in the counting, to be very clear about how this is happening, so that we don't, we all see this as one collective push, that we can, HSI can be kind of a Trojan horse for greater racial equity across the board, but it can very easily be turned into a way of pitting minoritized groups against each other. We need to be very careful and cognizant about that trap. Yeah, thank you for sharing all the good questions and the answers, Dr. Cuellar. Um, yeah, and our guests. Uh, and thank you for the good questions from both y'all. I thought those were really great and like generative for me. Um, I'm Ignacio or Nacho Alarcón. They and them are great pronouns. Currently running our campus as a documented student center, which is the first physical space of its kind across the country. Um, I'm pretty uniquely, I guess, interested or like uh, particularly interested in ways in which um, Perhaps y'all have both seen um, funds that uh, have been, like I, I get that there's really stringent reporting requirements for federal grants, and I'm curious about what ways in which you've seen Hispanic serving institutions uh, be able to provide material relief with grant funds to folks who are undocumented, documented, and non-immigrant visa holders. Um, most often those will be folks on T visas, U visas, F1 and J1 visas as well too. Um, if you have any particular best practices, examples, projects, initiatives, or 
um, careful considerations and advice to have. I'd be appreciative to hear that. That's a lot. His response is interesting because he's in Arizona. So let's just start there. When I visited, I was like, y'all in Arizona? I, I ain't got no answers for y'all. Y'all just in Arizona, right? Like Arizona's hard. You got to recognize the state you're in is actually matters. <laughs> it matters a lot how much you can support undocumented students. Um, but yeah, so federal funding for HSIs uh, is actually grant uh, or capacity building grants. So if an institution is going to move towards supporting undocumented students or any students, any way that they're going to, it actually has to be at that level. So it's, um, you know, like at an institutional level. So we might use our institutional funding to like build spaces, right, or centers, stuff like that. That's allowed, but never nothing at the individual level. So you cannot use federal, the federal funding from these grants for that kind of stuff, right? So there's not going to be any individual relief um, for, for students. It's, it's got to be capacity building for the entire institution. Um, but the state does matter. I have done a lot of work in Illinois. And Illinois, if y'all are unaware, is actually a very undocumented friendly state. They have lots of progressive uh, policies around supporting undocumented students. Um, they have in-state tuition. They recently passed um, an initiative to um, allow folks to go through like certain certifications. Because so we could support undocumented students and then they graduate and then they're no longer supported. There's that, there's that reality of like, then they can't get jobs, right? Like, okay, now what? Um, so our career centers need to be thinking critically about this. I don't meet a lot of career centers committed to serving this. And I think that's a piece we need to think of, start thinking a little bit more critically is bringing our career centers in to the conversation about what happens after they graduate because we only get them for four or five or six years. Then they got to go out and, and get jobs or whatever they're going to do. Um, but yeah, Illinois, they just passed uh, recently legislation to allow folks to take certain certifications for like nursing, right? Nursing was one of them, um, which is important, right? Because if they can't even take the certification, the licensing test, they can't go on and get jobs, right? It's like um, dang near impossible. Um, and so I think we have to, you know, do think critically about what state you're in. Y'all are also in, a, obviously, a friendly state, undocumented a friendly state and system also. Um, so there's more work you can do around there. Um, but there has to be those conversations and advocacy work. And I, hopefully you can speak to some of that in Arizona. There has to be advocacy work at the state. Y'all gonna have to march on over. You're right here, you know, like close to the state and say, in demand, right? Do the lobbying for the kind of support that you need for undocumented students and other students, right? If you're, um, you could use this designation to support lots of students. So, um, but yeah, we gotta think really critically about the context that we're in for undocumented students. So, I don't really have best practices around that because I'm in Arizona. We're really, I mean, in, in, it's, it's a really weird thing because I know that there's tons of issues in the state of California, but I come here and it is like, Okay, <sighs> I could take a breath for a second, and I know it's not. I know it's sort of a false breath, but it's there is something about having a state constantly bearing down on different populations, and there's something about that pressure. It's part of the reason why I had my earlier comment about it, it, it's almost like the entire country has become what Arizona was in 2010. Like the, and the say, and so I was really familiar with this process because we did it in 2010, 2011, 2012. And then all of a sudden, 2016 hits. And I'm like, oh, I've seen this before. Um, having said that, there's a couple of different things. Um, number one is that there's always ways of sort of sidestepping if you can get private funding, and using the bully pulpit of a chancellor, a president, a provost to be able to do this, like if they really say, oh yeah, we totally want to support undocumented students, they're out there constantly fundraising. I mean, your chancellor is your, basically your CEO who's out there saying, you want to make a smart investment with your you know, millions of dollars from Silicon Valley, come back and invest it in our educational institution. Well, you know how powerful that can be if it's dedicated to marginalized groups? We actually had, and I'm going to do sort of a corollary to a different program, and it doesn't have the same political risk, but it'll give you an idea of how powerful this can be. In Arizona, we had a program called the Arizona Assurance Scholars Program, because our president said there should not, like, being low income should not be a deterrent from accessing the University of Arizona. And so he spent like three or four years, him and his partner, whenever they would go anywhere, it was like there's this moral imperative that we need to raise funds to make it so that low income kids can come here and leave debt free. 
And so it was like if you're if you're if you're uh, forty two thousand four hundred dollars in annual income in your family, you will graduate from the University of Arizona debt free if you graduate in four years. And they were out there campaigning constantly for it, and they actually raised millions of dollars because people respect that 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 uh, position. And so the point being that if you throw up a moral imperative. I mean, shoot, folks do this all the time for football, and football doesn't need any goddamn money. Like, that, it, it's a stupid investment that loses money on the regular, but no, it gets our name out there. And our, I got issues with college athletics. I love watching college, I'm a hypocrite because I love watching college athletics, but I hate, <laughs> no, I do. I love watching college athletics, and I also hate the way that it, that all too often we have Instead of an institution with a football team associated with it, it's a football team with an institution associated with it. The overall point, getting back to it, is that if, there, if the institution really does value this, says we, if there's a moral imperative to supporting these, they should be making the investments in it. And all too often, though, folks say, well, you know, with undocumented students, we can't talk about it, we can't do it. The very first thing I have to say is, where does it say you can't do that? Ask the question of why are you, why are you silencing yourself? Because a lot of times, it's self-censorship. We think we can't talk about it because there might be repercussions, but, and sometimes there are. I mean, again, I'm in Arizona. You talk too openly about undocumented students, you can face some really serious repercussions. But all too often, we take it way, way, way too far with this chilling effect. We don't talk about it nearly enough because we think that there's good. We imagine how bad the effects will be. And, and, and the, you know, the Board of Regents and the legislators and the governor always threaten, oh, we're going to pull your funding. Really do it. And they never do. I mean, they do in terms of they continually disinvest from higher education. But they're like, we will pull $25 million from your budget. Well, you're not. Stop it. It's just an empty threat. And so then the, the president has to go and do a little dog and pony show before a, our Board of Regents. But fundamentally, it doesn't really cost them anything except a little political capital. And there's a difference between political capital and the lives of students. And I think that's an important calculation. Oh, we can't really have a meaningful conversation about trans students on campus because it'll make our conservative legislator upset. What are they going to do? What are they going to do if we have gender-inclusive bathrooms on campus? What? You're going to keep, I mean, they're already decreasing our funding. You just keep doing it? Fine. Like, that's, that's what you're already doing. So anyway, a lot of it takes challenging administration to have some moral courage in these situations. And if they continue to profess it, holding them accountable and saying, then what are you going to do tangibly? <laughs> Before we start to wrap up, just because we're, we're, we're nearing uh, time, but I want to thank... Um, all of those great questions. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Danny Martinez, who really was the mastermind for driving this, this speaker series and really bringing some critical thought for us to really kind of chew and grapple with. And one of the things that we were talking about earlier today is that uh, Gina and Nolan have been on the speaker circuit, you know, and kind of One's at one institution, the other one's there the next week, and vice versa. But we're the first institution to bring them together, right? And I kind of have seen other people saying like, oh, we need to do that, right? But I will state claim that we were the first to do that. So thank you, Danny, for that, for your leadership. But please join me again in just thanking and welcoming Gina and Nolan to our community and for giving us lots of things to think about. <laughs>